Football made simple. Become great at your craft by finding ways to make it simple for those around you. This is the Coaching 101 Podcast, hosted by Find A Way Productions. With your co-host, Daniel Chamberlain and Kenny Simpson. What's up, coaches? This is the Coaching 101 Podcast. I'm Daniel Chamberlain, here with Coach Simpson. How you doing, Coach? Oh, hot. Man, it's hot this summer. Uh, you know, you never... Uh, you know it's coming, but you don't ever really prepare for it. And we talked about this last episode. I do okay in the heat. Like, I'm okay in the heat, but our kids are not so good in the heat. You know, you have those... I think, like, guys that are above 240... Like they're a different player when the temperature is below 70 than when it's above 90, you know, it's, and I don't know if you, you deal with that, but like we got these, we got a couple 300 pounders on our team that when that heat gets up, whew, man, it's, it's, it's tough. And it scares you a little bit, you know, especially now how acclimated or not acclimated kids are to that. Yep. And so, you know, we, we try to practice in the mornings this summer just to kind of get out of all the, the heat uh, but it's still pretty warm. I uh, I listen to the Huberman Lab podcast quite a bit, and uh, Dr. Huberman is the he's like one of the lead neuroscientists over at Stanford University. But he just is all about the body and body parts and sleep. You know, that's where I got I started listening to him was um, how to control your sleep and get away from like Ambien or um, melatonin, all that crazy stuff. He gives you like a natural. I guess melatonin is is natural, but. It turns out the medicine that you are putting in your body, it's not regulated and you might get 600 milligrams. Or you might get zero if you take little gummies or pills or whatever. So mm-hmm. melatonin's a bad deal for you. But anyway, he, he has a little sleep cocktail that I bought and it, man, it works wonders. And that came from, like, I had borderline insomnia. So um, I started using his little sleep cocktail and I don't need anything. Like it just reset my sleep pattern. So Dr. Human, uh, Huberman Lab is huge podcast to listen to, but I said all that to say that he discussed um, acclimating yourself early in the year. And essentially, if you want to be able to handle the heat well, wear your winter clothes as long as possible. So even when it starts getting to those muggy 80 degree days, keep a hoodie on. You don't have to wear sweatpants, but wear long pants. Like stay in that frigid spring morning mentality as long as you can handle it and, and it, a little bit beyond. And then when you do have to take it off because it's 100 plus outside, your body will think it's in that 80 to 90 degree range. Like you can just handle the heat better. Same thing on the reverse side. So those kids that are, um, you know, they hate the cold. And you talk about big boys can't do the the, the heat. I talk about the skill kids that can't handle the cold because their hands are too cold or my toes are frozen. Um, that stuff doesn't exist in the military world, right? We just have to kind of suck it up and move on. But when it's your diva playmakers out there, you're like, all right, let's get you the little hand warmers, whatever we can do. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's kind of the same thing as, as uh, Dr. Huberman talks about the longer you can stay in um, short sleeves and shorts after the summer has gone out of, you know, is phasing out and you get into that, that fall and, you know, us down here in, in our area, there's no fall. <laughs> it's, it's a hundred degrees one day and it's snowing the next. And we're not really sure why this happens, but uh, you know, it just falls off. But as long as you, the longer you can stay in that summer attire getting into the winter, the better you'll handle that, handle that cold weather. So it is there is there's science behind it there's some studies you can read but it is worth maybe those big boys this year coach you just need to keep them in winter clothes as long mm-hmm. as possible um i know my brother's a pretty big boy and he never puts on a jacket so he just is shorts and t-shirts his whole life doesn't matter how cold it is um uh, anyway just just a little side piece look up the huberman lab it's a pretty good podcast uh, but yes, man, summer ball, uh, summer workouts and, and everything is upon us. Um, I hope everyone's summer programs, uh, we call it summer pride. I assume everyone pretty much does, right? Is that a, something like that? Yeah. That's some kind of a universal term. We have to have summer pride. Um, I hope everyone's is going well and your boys are getting stronger, um, or girls. We had a girl kicker this last year. It, it happens. Okay. The girls play football too. Um, yeah. Uh, any, anything special with, with, uh, the, the coach Simpson football that's going on this summer. Y'all oh one? yeah. No, we got back from Iowa. That was a really fun trip and enjoyed getting to be up there, work with two schools up there, kind of putting in the gun team, met a lot of coaches, a lot of good kids and had a lot of fun with coach Gould. You know, that's kind of always a, it's always fun to travel with Bo. He, he didn't like airplanes. <laughs> he snores like a freight train. And so anytime I get to travel with him, it's always a fun 
experience. We do have a really good time together. I think that's one of those deals where uh, Bo's one of those guys that I think understands you only get, you know, one chance at, at doing a lot of these really cool things. You need to enjoy them. And it helps me because I'm much more task oriented, like right. do a task, get it done. And who cares about enjoyment? You know, where Bo kind of brings that element of humor and makes things really, really fun. So we've had a good time doing that. Uh, now I'll be focusing on my own team, you know, selling fireworks to the fourth year, but then I'll be selling folks on my own team. We've got hopefully big plans coming up uh, this year. Uh, excited about the group and, and uh, really just ready to hit someone that's not our own guy, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I, when I talk about somebody that stutters, uh, stutters, oh, sorry, that snores a lot. Um, those are always great travel companions when you have your own motel room. Like that's fine. We do Airbnb, so I have my own room. So. There you go. Yeah, that's the way to do it, man. Like, love you, Dan. Through the, throughout the day, in the evening, you just get to go home, man. <laughs> yep. Well, Coach, why don't you uh, share some ways that coaches can make things simple for their staff or for their athletes? Sure. Uh, Coaching 101 Podcast is sponsored by Find Away Productions. Find Away Productions also sponsors OffensiveCoordinatorAcademy.com. All things offense, including the full academy, offensive line workbook, offensive coordinator workbook, quarterback workbook, and multiple materials, including an editable play call sheet. And lots of other courses are over at OffensiveCoordinatorAcademy.com. It also sponsors DefensiveCoordinatorAcademy.com. All things defense, including the full academy, the defensive line academy and workbook. Multiple courses over there at the defense at defensivecoordinatoracademy.com. Finally, it also sponsors fbcoachsimpson.com, the original, the OG website, which houses the gun T system. Um, over nine books on the gun T, 60 plus hours if you want the full system, or you can just kind of a la carte and choose what you want. Also houses all of the workbooks, head coach workbook offensive coordinator workbook, and so on and so forth, and 30 total books, including head coaching books, fundraising books, scheme books, and the three-fourths swarm defensive system, which is also over at fbcoachsimpson.com. If you don't want to pay for a book, we also offer a free magazine, Headsets, the digital magazine. Finally, if you'd like to get updates on when our podcast is dropping, you can, of course, subscribe or like to what you're listening to right now. Or go over to fbcoachsimpson.com slash podcast, and we will put you on our email list, let you know when the new podcasts are coming out, other new materials. That's fbcoachsimpson.com slash podcast. Um, my old head coach, Bo Collins, just bought into your the full system. Yeah, I know he was, he was talking back and forth with you a little bit before he pulled the trigger. And that thing is so well laid out. You did a very wonderful job with just breaking it down by, I, I mean, it's, I feel like the clinics, the national clinics are, are it, it feels the exact same. I feel like I'm back in that chair with a notepad and I can just run through the system. It, it is really wonderful. So uh, it's very good, very good, well put together program. Um, if you, if you're looking for a football program, it's definitely one It's uh, you know, coaches got all the testimonials. People are putting up some points. So um, it's, Great program to buy into. Yeah, it's been fun to watch guys win state championships. I would, I think, I need a ring because I get we've had about twelve guys ran the gun team, won a state championship, and I'm over here struggling to win six or seven games. So appreciate the support, and apparently those guys are doing really, really well with it. It's been really cool to hear, like Bo. We it's now actually gun team is now run on six continents, all fifty states. Really, really cool to hear guys running the offense all over. It's been really, really a neat experience. And hopefully, like you mentioned, we hope to put a good product out that can help coaches. Yeah, I, I think I would be liaisoning for a, or what, I, I would be reaching out for a, a ring. Like, hey, boys, I need a championship ring. And then you just start your own, them. put them on the wall, man. Yeah. I've got, now, I'll say this, I do about 15 different hoodies from guys that have sent me, because they know I like gear. So they send me right. all their gear. It's all around my office. You can't see it behind me because I got the screen up here, but. I've got all kinds of gear up here and uh, I've got a couple of colleges running my offense. So I've got their gear and rock. My son rocks that all over our town. So it's been fun to kind of connect that way. There you go. Um, also 
behind the podcast is Adaptable Physical Therapy. So that is my wife, Dr. Samantha Chamberlain. She's a physical therapist. We have our own clinic in Grove, Oklahoma. Um, she specializes in concussions, of course, sports injuries and injury prevention. Um, if you're looking for a way to, you know, maybe it's programming your workouts throughout the summer. And, you know, we're all in the middle of summer now. If you want to start working on concussion prevention now, it's a real thing. It is doable. Um, those joints, of course, knees. It seems like knees are the terrors of the football world. Um, you can reach out to her and she can help you in some way of programming and, and getting your kids' knees stronger. Uh, the concussion thing, man, it, it's the, the science has gotten us out of the, the stone age of, of concussions. It's no longer sit in a room and it's dark and wait a week or two. No, it's get back out you know, as soon as possible, get some movement, push through some symptoms. Um, of course, no contact. We're still not crazy. We're not trying to get another concussion, but um, the science has definitely changed. And also, um, athleticspeedmovement.com. So that is a, a thing that I'm helping create and push out. And this is a way that you can teach your kids to be fast. Uh, and I know a lot of people say you can't coach speed. And it's just, unfortunately, it's just not true. At, especially at the age that we're all coaching, in these junior high and, and high school levels, your kids don't, they don't understand where their bodies are at anyway. Like their body awareness is, is almost none. Um, but if you can teach them how their body can run fast, I, I think you can see an overall team improvement. Um, we've seen people drop you know, six tenths off their 40 time or, you know, and the 40 is not the ultimate running score. It's not the ultimate speed test, but it is the one that unfortunately most people use. So the, there's definitely ways out there to teach your kids how to run that can increase their speed. And it's also movement, how to move as a football player, right? It's not all linear speed. It's not all, you know, the weight room will help you. Okay. But if you're not going out and practicing the fundamentals, you're just hurting yourself. You know, our goal is to get people to leave the grass long for you whenever you're on an away game. And that's, that's kind of, it's always been the sign, and I've even been that on that squad, right? When the coach says, "Uh, we got them coming to town this week. We ain't we ain't touching the grass after Monday, right?" It gets one one uniform cut, and then that's it. We're gonna let it ride. So um, that's what, that's our goal is to make sure that everybody's leaving the grass long whenever you come to play on their turf. So uh, that's over at um, athleticspeedandmovement.com. dot com. All right, coach, we'll jump right into our question here. So the, tonight's topic is going to be situational football, which is something I have to admit. Um, I've got to get better at as a coach, so I'm going to enjoy this episode, and I'm going to learn as much as most of our listeners tonight. Um, so first question is just what are situations that are important to understand? So you're talking situational football. Well, I mean, there's a ton. You know, football is kind of a complicated game, um, and unfortunately you're dealing with players that now, you know, they're not coaches, so they don't have the expertise that hopefully you do, or a lot of times as coaches we're running into new situations. So I'm just going to kind of cherry pick three major areas that we try to focus on. We talk about situational football with our kids. The first one is the most obvious one, but I don't know how many times it has come back to bite you, but it's down in distance. Just understanding where the sticks are, what you've got to do, and, and how that can impact the game. And a lot of times, these situations I'm saying as a coach, you're probably saying, of course, I know that. And, and the reality is I don't really care what you know because you're not the one playing the game. Right. What do your kids know? And that's, so that's the one thing we want to do a lot of times is we'll bring the sticks out of practice and we'll go through third down and how far we have to get. Or if you don't want to bring the sticks out, just tell them, Hey, the 20 is the first down and back the ball up so they can kind of understand we have to get here on this down for down and distance to matter. We don't ever practice first downs or second downs at our school. We only practice third downs and fourth downs. Uh, simply because that's what's going to win or lose the game. So we focus on those down and distance things often. I had a kid, a real smart kid, quarterback for me, two-year starter, ran out of bounds on a fourth down and like three, ran out of bounds a yard short. Um, and we just, from then on, we've just practiced this over and over and over. And kids need to practice these things. We do it every single practice. So when I say down and distance, I'm not talking about do it once a week. We do it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So when Friday comes around, we know what our third and sixth play is. Not me. Our kids know. Like our kids know, okay, third and sixth, we're probably going to run this play because we've practiced it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and now it's Friday. So that's what we're going to do. You know, they understand not just offensively, but defensively. They understand I'm a DB. I'm playing cover two read or whatever I'm playing. Right. I'm going to sit on the sticks. Like, I'm going to sit where they're going to run. We had an outside linebacker get a pick this year. Huge game for us. 
because he understood, hey, on third down, they're going to run basically an out cut at the sticks. So we practice all week, find the sticks. That's the angle of your drop. And that's where you're going to go when it paid off for them. So that's the first thing is down in distance. Second thing is time management. You know, understanding how to work time management. I think that's huge for kids, especially end of half, end of game. When you think about it, those are the situations that usually dictate who wins or loses the game. You know, if you're talking about a crunch time situation, you're talking about the end of the half or the end of a game that's competitive. So those kind of situations, we practice usually one time management situation per day. So it might be an easy one where, hey, we're up and we have to run the clock out. So we're going to work that on Monday. And defense is working. We have to get the ball back because we're down. Then you flip it on Tuesday. And right now we're down. We have to go down and get a field goal at the end. So we're not just going to work offense. We're going to mix in a special teams there. So now we have to go down, get in field goal range, kick a field goal, and then kick the ball off and protect that. All right. Then come back the next day. Now we're down two scores. So we have to go down and score. We have to onside kick. We have to recover the kick. We got to go down and score again. And then now we might have nickel defense out there. So, or maybe it's, hey, it's fourth down and we're going sell out block. So we're going to work. We're bringing 11 people to go block a punt. You know, that's a situation you're looking at in time management that you wouldn't always get if you're only doing these things on Thursday. Or it could be, you know, we have no timeouts. We ran a play on third down and sprint the field goal team out there, and they've got to kick a field goal with no timeouts, get set, kick the goal, you know. So there's all these different time management situations that aren't just offense or defense. I mean, they do affect offense and defense. For example, does your quarterback know, you know, what are, what are the non-negotiables in a two-minute drill? Well, he should know, don't take a sack, and he should know, you know, uh, don't throw a pick. And those are kind of obvious ones. You know how many times my quarterbacks have screwed that up in practice? A lot. And so I would rather they <laughs> screw it up in practice so that we can get better at it so they yeah. don't do it in the game. Or as a coach, I learn this kid's not a great two-minute quarterback. You know, and that's okay. Like, that's that could be good at other things. I now know my play calls need to be much safer, more conservative, because he's not ready yet to make some of those plays I want him to make. So working those time management situations is huge, especially the summer. If you're able to do team camps, we do team camps. I always, if I'm in charge, there's always a time management element somewhere at these team camps so we can practice that kind of stuff. Okay. Same thing on defense. Two minutes to go. Don't want to give up a touchdown. How many times have you all watched them let a guy get behind them on third and long or with 30 seconds to go in a game? That's situational awareness. That's the kid not being aware of the situation of the game. And the only way that's going to happen is for you to practice it, let him fail, correct him, and get it right. So that's another one. So the third one is areas on the field. So for me, areas on the field, understanding like red zone. So like for us, just a couple of general things. Are what do we expect the defense to do when we get into kind of the scoring zone down here? Well, they're probably going to blitz. We're probably going to see man-to-man. -man. We're probably going to see everything kind of condense. Everything's a little tighter. What about defensively? Are you talking to your DBs? We tell our guys once they cross about the 20, all the don't let them behind you stuff we've told you all game, that's out the window. Now make them throw it over your head. And so the whole game flipped for that position group once you got inside whatever you've decided that's going to be. Could be with your defense alignment where you say, hey, look, if they get inside the three-yard line, I don't care if you jump off sides, time it up. Time up all our blitzes, try to beat the snap, risk it, go get it. Because if they get a penalty, okay, they get a half yard. Right. So we've done things where we've shifted and bumped. I hope no one, no officials listening to this, but where we've tried to get them to simulate the snap count. All right, who cares if they catch us, they get a half yard. If they don't catch us and they fall start, they back up five. Right. So working those field zone area things is important you're talking about backed up punt have you practiced punting when you're your own two yard line or is the first time you're going to do that like the miami dolphins and you're going to punt it off the rear end of the up man because you didn't practice it enough obviously so those are things you got to work on when you're talking about situational football 
So, you know, it's funny you mentioned all these, these situations, and a lot of them I have seen my teams fail at over the years, over the last few years. Um, a lot of times they're special teams, and it just goes to show we don't spend enough time on special teams, right? And it's that's unfortunate. I had and when you're working with just the players you got, sometimes you know you don't you're not filled in 45, 50 kids. You do have to work those offense and defense so much because it, it is primary parts of the game. Um, but you got to take time out. And it, you know, I've seen a couple examples this year. You know, we we tried to go out and uh, we we had two different punts. We have a quarterback punt. So he can fake it. We can run a four. You know, in one game he kept us in the game with two seventy-five yard bombs on fake punts on fourth down forever. Right? They, they, the team just refused to cover our trip side. We uh, we would motion a guy across. They wouldn't cover him. We throw the bomb on him, and, and we went down and scored. Um, really kept us in the game. Um. Anyway, we ran him out in one game, and it should have been our actual punter. We needed the long bomb leg. We didn't need the quarterback who just kind of hopes one will hit the ground and roll. Well. That was wrong. And then later on that game, we were down in the red zone and we really needed to fake it. The game was kind of on the line. And for whatever reason, our actual punter runs out and we're, and then it kicks out of the back of the end zone and we net like three yards because it, it didn't matter, right? But he wasn't, he didn't have the coffin corner punt thing going for him. He just had a, a booming leg. And, uh, and and the quarterback, of course, you know, that's where we needed him to either fake it or just kind of give us a little pooch kick. So, yeah, just knowing which punter is supposed to be in the game, that's something we could have taught our kids better. Uh, that same punter that was the booming punter, you know, he was our field goal kicker. He just had a – the dude had a leg. Uh, it, it wasn't always super accurate, but he could put, you know, 50 yards on it. And so um, multiple times in the same game, unfortunately, and then once again later in the season, we couldn't find our little kicking block, right? The, and – you know, and it cost us points. It cost us games because we're s desperately searching for this little block to put on the ground to kick a field goal uh, all over the place. We can't find them. And so that came back to us, right? Coaches, where's our equipment at? Have we practiced it? Where does it go every single time? And why is the kicker not keeping up with it? Well, he's also because mm -hmm. he's a defensive end and sometimes plays tight ends. So that's why he's not holding on to it. But, you know, so those little situations we needed to practice better. And then I saw at uh, TCU this year, you know, they won a game you know, by running out a field goal kicker with like six seconds on the clock or something, and they booted one for you know, 35, 45 yards, whatever it was, they had no time. I mean, should not have been able to go out and kick that field goal, but they'd practice it so much that it didn't bother them. They just go out, line it up, kick the thing, and the game, you know, whistle blows while it's in the air, and, and who cares? They win the game. So mm -hmm. um, it was kind of a success story that wasn't our team and a and a lack of success story that was our team, unfortunately, but those things are very, very valuable. Those situations, uh, and that's just special teams. And, and offense and defense, that's where my coaching education has to get better because there's still ones that I probably would screw them up, right? I mean, we'll watch NFL head coaches screw up time management. We watch Tom Brady, you know, throw away a pass on fourth down and, and throw up, you know, his four fingers like it's fourth down. Yeah, it, it was, Tom, <laughs> right? He's the greatest right. to ever do it. So kids are going to mess up. Coaches are going to mess up. But, man, you sure can practice them and, and lower that margin of error. Mm-hmm. All right, so second question here. Um, why should we practice situational football throughout the week? Uh, well, first of all, um, you know, when they when they, when you watch games, so I know a lot of guys that are listening to podcasts probably are avid football fans, I'd imagine. What do they always show at the end of the game, which usually lets you know who won or lost? They always show a certain amount of stats. Generally, those stats relate to third down conversion rate and red zone conversion rate. Like when you look right. at the main stats that matter, those are the two that kind of stand out in the situational football world. You talk about, you know, the if so-and-so team won, you know, they were 45% on third down. So that's a really good conversion rate. And if they didn't win, they might have been one of 10 on third downs. Well, that means they, they lost their drive. So those stats matter the most. And then you also look at like red zone. They got in the red zone five times and only scored one touchdown. Well, you're probably not going to win that game. You know, right. you get in the red zone four times, you score four times, your odds of winning, you know, drastically went up. So those are the stats that matter. You know, a lot of times we lose the forest for the trees as coaches. You know, we need to work on fundamentals and we need to work on technique and we need to work on plays and defensive scheme and all of that stuff matters. It really does. However, we don't ever work on the actual game. Like we just line the ball up in the middle of the field 
and practice that stuff, but we don't practice our, what if the ball's on the left hash, you know, how are we going to adjust our defensive structure to that? What about offensively? How are we going to take advantage of two thirds of the field at the high school level over here? Are we going to, you know, what are we going to do with that? What about third and five? What are we going to do on those plays? So those are the things that you have to kind of look at during team. So when you're practicing those things, I know that's going to be your next question coming up, Daniel, but you got to practice that inside of your team period every single day. Okay. And then the second thing on this one, you know, why do we need to practice? Well, kids don't watch football. You know, I'm talking about guys that are listening to this podcast, probably coaches, not just coaches, but hardcore football fans, probably. We watch football. So we have seen all of these situations play out at one time or another. And I'm the one yelling at the TV on Sunday about time management because I've watched enough games to kind of be aware of that. Your kids don't. They don't watch the NFL, rarely. They rarely watch college football. If they do, it's usually like my son does, where he just watches all the highlights. So he don't really watch a full game and understand kind of how all of this lays out, like how much time can we kill here? How much time do I need to let the clock run down to one before I snap it at quarterback? So there's so many little situations that your kids really don't get unless you practice them with them doing it. And so they, you're going to have to work at all that stuff. The third one is this, and this one sounds a little bit tougher, but coaches need this stuff too. Like you need to go through this. I need to go through this, not just for myself. That is a big part of it. Like I need to work on calling a two minute offense and practicing that because believe it or not, sometimes the pressure gets to coaches too. You know, I watched the Miami Dolphins lose a playoff game because they couldn't get a play in on fourth and one. That was a young coach who's going to get better and better. And I'm a huge fan of him. Huge, yep. huge fan of him. But I, if you ask him to be honest, he would say that that falls on him. You know, get the freaking play in. It's not that hard. If we say that, but being in that situation is tough. And so you need to practice that stuff as a coach. We put our headsets on on Tuesdays and Wednesdays and practice how that's going to look in a game because we need to work through that kind of stuff, not just for us. So that part's the first part, but we also need to learn what our kids can do. Like I mentioned it a little bit earlier in the first section, what can your quarterback actually do? Well, this is your chance to see in a low pressure situation, what can he do? Has he learned how to handle a two minute drive or is he not ready for that yet? You know, what can our, defense do can we get in multiple calls to our defensive players in these critical situations where we can roll down and sit on the sticks and rob their best player all that stuff looks great when you draw it up can we do that stuff on high intensity situations when i'm not on the field and so that's why you work all this stuff and, and again daniel you mentioned it that doesn't even touch special teams that didn't even touch special teams. If you onside kick, probably your season is on the line. So understand, like, it's not a Thursday we work onside kicks and just have a kind of a screw around session. If you're doing that in a game or a sellout block, probably the game and maybe your season is on the line in that moment. Have you dedicated the right amount of time to be prepared for that? Have you talked to your punt returner to not catch a ball kicked over his head inside the 10. Have you had that conversation with him? Have you practiced it? Have you talked about, okay, we don't, we want to return this for a touchdown, you know, so we're going to do a sellout return or what about they kick off to you with five seconds left. Have you worked through that play? What's that look like? Are you going to pitch it around? You know, what are you going to do in those situations? Well, you got to practice all that stuff because if you don't, and the first time you're exposed to it, is on Friday, it's probably not going to go very, very well for you. Yep. Um, I'm I'm a little bit different on two-point conversions. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, on onside kicks and two-point conversions, and I'm going to do it every time, guy. So uh, yeah. onside every time, man, let's go. And, and in that becomes a refinement of the process and getting better at it. You also make yourself more aware that it could happen to you and how to stop it because now you're seeing it every day in practice. Um, so hopefully our season's not online, but I guess it is in every play for – for the teams that I've been with, unfortunately. Um, 
We, I mean, we lost a game last year because our punter tried to run up on one from like the 10 to the 12 or something and, and catch a ball and it bounced off his chest and then they broke his ankle at the same time. Like the guy hit him still, he still took a shot and it broke his ankle and he was our starting free safety. So that ended up costing us that game right then. And then it cost us the rest of the season because now we're out our, our top tackler. So, um, I think coaches absolutely need it. And we, it's one of those things. It's like we we believe. We just think it's going to be easier than what it is. Um, I, I'm a comedy fan, and I was listening to uh, the Kill Tony podcast this week, and I don't know if you've ever heard Kill Tony, but essentially the guy just comes. Lets a whole bunch of new comics that have not, or maybe they've done it some, but they come on and they get 60 seconds to do a thing, and then they critique them. And this guy comes on with no plan whatsoever. He doesn't even have a single joke written. He just thinks he's going to roast the host. And he does terribly, and it's because he never practiced. And Roseanne Barr was on there, and she was like, you thought it was going to be easy, didn't you? And I was like, man, if that doesn't explain everything we we do in life, especially in coaches, right? You just Sometimes you just think it's going to be easy. I just, I'm going to call Buck. Or I'm going to call Power. I know what I'm going to do. Are you? Have it, has it been getting shut down all night long, and like it's third and five, and they've stopped Buck all night, and, and that you're one RPO, right? Your little peak or whatever you want to call it, and you're, They've got them both locked down. What are you going to do? What's next? Like we, we called a pace plan in, in the military, uh, primary alternate contingency and emergency, right? So what's your, what's your third and fourth play? What's your contingency plan? What's your emergency plan? When I got that third and five, um, it ain't always going to be easy. Matter of fact, I would almost say it's never going to be easy. <laughs> if, if it is easy, uh, you probably just have more studs than the other guy. I said plan for the worst and hope for the best. That's kind of how I work situational football. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, all right, so how can we incorporate situational football into our practice plan? All right, well, there's a couple ways you can do it. Um, you know, and, and one of these is pretty obvious, but, I mean, you have to schedule it in practice. And I'm not just talking about schedule it in practice on Thursdays. We all do thorough Thursday or perfect Thursday or I don't, whatever you want to call it Thursday. But basically that helmet day where you're not really going to do individual, but you're going to go through and kind of do a play the game kind of thing. Um so obviously you need to do it then, but I think you need to do it within uh, your whole practice Monday on. The best time in my experience to do that is during team or seven on seven. If you're doing any kind of group, big group or team situation where, okay, anytime we snap it, something needs to be happening other than just the play. That could be moving from hash to middle to hash. That could be progressing down the field where we're now we're looking at, okay, we're in the red zone, we're at the 10 yard line, we're at the five yard line. That could be time management where, okay, we have, we're, we're up with four minutes to go. So all of this stuff needs to happen as you're the working team. And that's on both sides of the ball. So I'm not just talking offense here, but defense, they understand, okay, we're down four with two minutes to go and we have to either let them score a touchdown or create a turnover. Do they know that? You saw the Super Bowl most recently, you know, where the Chiefs knew don't go score here because the game is over. Like that was something that they had to know. So have you worked that kind of scenario with your kids? That's becoming more and more prevalent. You know, have you worked all these things? And the best time to do it is in team. And the only way you'll cover a variety is to work them every single day. So I'm not saying work the same scenario. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I'm saying to work a different scenario, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then on Thursday, try to hit most of them. Yep. And then the next week, work another scenario, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, try to work a, a general. That way you've at least covered most of these scenarios with your kids. Number two, you need to work it in the middle of practices like you would work it in a game. So if you're scheduling your practices right now, like most teams, 99% uh, of teams are, special teams are either up front or at the end. Offense and defense is kind of the majority of it. That's fine. But you need to work some of your special teams inside of your team periods. So that might be red zone offense. We're also going to work our field goal team. Or, Dan, you mentioned going for two. That's You can work it then. But what are we going to do after we score? or when we have goal to go, you know, so that stuff can be worked then. What about third down periods? Well, that's a good time to work punt team. You didn't create, get a first down, go punt. 
Okay, and that's a chance for you defensively. You've got to stop on third down, go block the punt. And so you're working these scenarios inside of team. I'm not saying installing them and taking forever. We do all our install stuff up front. When we get into team, it needs to kind of move fluid like a game would move. So when I call that special team, that 11 ought to come out. A lot of times we're doing this on air or on bags, and they're going to go through their special team. And so that's a really good way to work it. We also work, we have what we call like fast-paced offensive plays. We call them NASCAR plays. So we'll work those randomly throughout practice as well, where we create a play and then bam, we're running a tempo play right now. And so defense needs to see that too. It might be where you're playing an up-tempo team, so they run a play, and then you have a second scout team that just lines up in some crazy formation they got to identify. So those are things you can work inside of practice. Number three, play as many B team games as possible. So I've got four four points on this one, but play as many B team games as possible because I think that's the only way kids are going to get exposed to this is seeing these situations. We talk about coaches needing to work it. Well, that's a great time. There's like 12 fans in the stands on a JV game. Go through these scenarios with low pressure. I mean, I, I've never seen a coach get fired for losing JV games on Monday. You know, so you can probably work through some stuff here and see what happens and have low pressure. Same thing with the kids. If they win JV, that's cool, but no one really cares about JV wins. They care about varsity wins. So you can kind of go through low pressure on that stuff. And then the fourth point is watch special teams as a team. You know, so cherry pick three or four special teams with your whole team and watch them and talk about the importance of it. Uh, Daniel mentioned it. Realistically, you don't practice special teams a third of the time. I know it's a third of the game. According to some people, no, it's not really, because you run 90 plays of offense and 90 plays of defense and like 30 plays of special teams. That's not a third if you're really a math guy. However, there needs to be enough emphasis on the situations in special teams that your guys are aware. Like, what do we do when we block a punt? We scoop it up. We never fall on it because it's fourth down. What do we do? We block a kick. Same thing. What about if we block it and it rolls forward? What about that one? So those are things you've got to go through with your guys. And the best way to do that is either off of film or with the team when you go out there on the field, depending on how they learn. But those situations, again, change games. They don't happen often. So we kind of don't do them a lot, but they change the game like a blocked punt, and you fall on it, that was a potential touchdown you just blew. You yeah. know, we won the biggest game in our school's, probably our school's history, last year because we called our timeouts because the other coach didn't use good clock management. We burned all our timeouts, and we blocked a punt, picked it up, and ran into the end zone with about 30 seconds to go in the half because we had worked that. We were good. We were ready with scenarios. We had worked on blocking a punt. We knew to pick it up. We knew to go. So – the kids made the plays, but we had worked that scenario. This was week nine. We had worked that scenario all year long, and it finally showed up in the biggest game of the season, and we made the play we needed to make. Um, I, You said something a while ago about, like, if you score, the game's over, and, and I can remember that. It goes back to situational football, and Oklahoma was – it was versus OSU, and I'll always remember it in Oklahoma State for some of y'all who live up north and think OSU is – Ohio State. But uh and I can remember Samaj J P Ryan taking a knee at the one. Mm -hmm. Right. Where it's going into score, the game's already over, it doesn't matter. And he takes a knee at the one, we just let the clock burn out. I think maybe it was it could have even been fourth down. It didn't matter. I don't think it was fourth down, but he chose not to score because he knew giving them the ball back was the worst possible thing we could do. Like just keep the ball. Let the time let time run out, right? It's and not only that, but it was a shot into the heart of every OSU fan who was really hoping to get that chance. You know what I mean? It was, it was more impactful than those six points would have ever been. Um, but there's all kinds of situations like that. Um, I like the idea of running things against you called your B games, right. And, and practicing those situations because you're right. It, it, the wins and losses almost don't matter. I mean, for the kids that you care and you want success because it will kind of, you want you want kids thinking they, it builds confidence. I know junior high kids that right. have gotten to high school and be like we've never beat that team. Like we can't possibly beat them this year. It's a whole different game, man. Now you're in varsity ball, but working those situations is pretty awesome. 
All right, man. Well, we're going to jump into everybody's favorite part of the podcast, and that's the what not to do as a coach here. Um, today's lesson, Coach, you want to give us a, a feel of what we're going to talk about today? Yeah, today's lesson and what not to do as a coach is do not assume. I think that's one of the biggest downfalls of most coaches is that just because you know does not mean your assistant coaches know and it definitely does not mean your 15, 16, 17-year-old players know. They most certainly probably do not know unless you have told them. So one of the things that we do is I talk to my coaches, always coach to the lowest level you're in your group. So if you've got 10th graders and seniors, coach to the lowest level. Coach to what that guy understands, and that way you're covering everybody. Okay. Second thing is we make sure that we literally talk through each scenario with every kid, and I make them repeat it to me like hey guys if we block a punt what do we not do fall on the punt and they go through so we just kind of put this into their brain guys it's third and three how long should our route be if we're running an out route at least four to five yards because we got to get past the sticks those are little things that you shouldn't think you should have to tell people i bet tom brady's coach didn't think he needed to remind the hall of fame quarterback who might be the best of all time throw the ball to a receiver on fourth down, but I bet you going <laughs> back, he wishes he did. Right. So do not assume that they know. Don't assume they know. Guys, you know, it's fourth down right here. You know where the sticks are right here. So you have to remind them constantly of these things uh, because they're in the middle of playing a game. They're 15, 16, 17, 18-year-old kids. Or if you're working with the staff, this could be a, a young coordinator Hey, you realize we talked about blitzing on third down. Here comes third down. Like over communicate. Yeah. Do not assume people know the situation that's showing up. Awesome, man. Um, I feel like, unfortunately, in, in the coaching world, we assume a lot of things about a lot of parts of the game. We always think our kids have been taught that. We always think our coaches have been taught that. You know, it doesn't matter what that is. Um, you know, it's, we can talk about day one, page one type stuff at Tulsa. Just talk about the field dimensions. Talk about where the hashes are and why. Um, you know, I mean, kids don't know sometimes that it's just like you said, they don't grow up watching football no. and that, that hurts different. I mean, not only situationally, they don't know, oh yeah, we've got three timeouts and a half use them before the half is up or they just go to waste, but they may not know many, many things, right? It's just the simplest of things they can just have never been taught. So they know to line up and hit the guy in front of them and maybe hit him harder than he hits us so that it doesn't hurt us as bad. All right, man. So we're going to get into um, our next ranking tonight. So um, we're going to do the, the podcast ranking tonight is going to be on our top 10 quarterbacks of all time. And this one's hard for me because I am 35 years old and I, like today's kids, did not watch a lot of NFL football growing up because we just, my family wasn't about sports. So um, I, my top 10 list is going to be different than yours and it's because it's a little bit of recency bias. <laughs> I've also put a little section in there for like guys who are now quarterbacks that are probably going to be on this list at some point. But uh, Kenny, if you want to go ahead and tell us your top 10 list of quarterbacks of all time. Sure. Uh, I'll let you talk about your on the way guys who I think just put a pin in that is yet to be seen on those guys. We'll see, but I'm going to do my, my guys that almost made the list or uh, guys that I'm, that I think were great quarterbacks that weren't quite there. So you have, in my opinion, Johnny Unitas, if you're looking at like the OG of quarterbacks. I think this guy was a guy, and Fran Tarkenton, those are two kind of older quarterbacks that played back in the day uh, that I think you could have made a case for being on the top 10, just probably were born in the wrong decade. You know, to be able to do what quarterbacks do now, it's so different. Uh, also, I included Kurt Warner. I think that had he been in the NFL longer, he's in the top 10. So if you're just looking at pure talent, I think he belongs there. I just didn't quite have the body of work for me to put up there. Um, and then you got, I think, I don't know if you put that or I put Mike Vick on there, but I think he was another one. Randall Cunningham would kind of fit in that world for me too, as would Warren Moon. I think all three of those quarterbacks were unbelievable. Uh, just unfortunately didn't quite last quite long enough in their in their career. Warren Moon, of course, had to go a whole different route to get there. So those are guys who barely missed the list. I don't think I have any, you know, I've got one current quarterback on my list. Uh, I think that the game is awesome right now. There are some great young quarterbacks, but they got a lot to prove. 
uh, before they get up here. I might have two up here. Yep. So I'm going to start with bottom number 10. Uh, Pittsburgh Steeler guys are going to love this because I put Terry Bradshaw up here. And the man won four Super Bowls. Uh, you have to give him some credit. I know it was Steel Curtain. I know he had weapons around him. He won four Super Bowls, and you got to give him some credit for that. So Terry Bradshaw was up there, number 10 for me, uh, number nine. Uh, and it hurts me to say this, and I'm looking forward to watching him play against the Dolphins. Uh, but Aaron Rodgers, I think you have to look at his career that he has had. Unbelievable career, in my opinion. I know he's got to put a couple more Super Bowls on there to really climb up the list a little more. So what he does with the Jets would be interesting to see. Um, I think he's I think he's probably on the downhill slope right now, but I think he had a great career. Uh, number eight, another one who had to kind of wait his time, Steve Young. And Steve Young had to sit there behind Joe Montana so he doesn't get the credit he really probably deserves for what he did in his limited time to shine. Different kind of quarterback, lefty, could run. A lot of fun to watch. So Steve Young was my number eight. Number seven for me is Drew Brees. I, that might just be me being a fanboy with him. I know he had some great stats, had some great wins. Unfortunately, did not have a great defense to help him a lot of the time. So I've got Drew Brees up there, number seven. Number six, number six for me is a current quarterback. I think he's the highest ranking current quarterback I've got, Patrick Mahomes. And I think he's going to continue to climb. So he's at six right now. Of course, win a couple more Super Bowls, and, and then he'll work his way up that list, I'm sure. I think we're witnessing greatness when you watch him play. Unbelievable. Big fan of him. Uh, number five is Brett Favre. I think Brett Favre kind of broke the mold of how quarterbacks played. Uh, just kind of a gunslinger. Um, personally, not my favorite guy to watch because I think he was a little wild for me. But I think you have to give him a lot of credit for what he did. Kind of put Green Bay back on the map. I had a great career for them. Number four is my boy, Dan Marino, probably the best pure passer on the whole list. If you just talk about a guy who was born with a right arm to throw it, it was Dan Marino. Unfortunately for him, Miami's defense was terrible and our running game was horrible his whole career. So a ton of good stats. Rewrote the entire record book before we decided to play touch football and it wasn't really real anymore. So I give him kind of extra stat, extra points for throwing it when they were able to hit him. Okay. Uh, number three, Peyton Manning. I think Peyton Manning speaks for himself. Probably my wife's favorite. Uh, dude is hilarious. Great quarterback. Has a couple of Super Bowls. So I ranked him a little bit ahead of Marino. Number two for me, uh, Joe Montana. You look at kind of the golden boy of quarterbacks. Four Super Bowls. Threw the ball really well. I know he had weapons around him. Uh, but you got to put him up near the top. And then number one for me, was Tom Brady. I think you have to kind of look at his body of work and his career. Won a Super Bowl at, at two different places. Uh, clearly was the reason for the New England Patriots dominance for such a long time. And I'm a big Bill Belichick fan. I know we'll do coaches down the road, but I think Tom Brady gets equal credit, if not more credit than Belichick should for what New England did over the last 20 some odd years. So that's my top 10 quarterbacks. Daniel, I'm checking out your list right here as I'm looking at it. It looks not bad. You got yeah, to so, the way to, I think you're more hopeful with your on the ways. So. Yeah, so we'll, I'm going to cover – so the, the guys that I left off, so I added Mike Vick to the list, and I think that the problem with greatest quarterbacks of all time is it's what were they asked to do, right? Because Michael Vick did not play quarterback the same as, as John Elway. He didn't play quarterback the same as Dan Marino. It's just the position – you know, when you're talking about – the best running backs of all time. Those guys, it's yards, touchdowns, Super Bowls, yards per play, et cetera. With quarterbacks, you look at Mike Vick, and it's like you can't make win-loss stat a quarterback stat, in my opinion, because I know we do, but I don't really think you should. There's, you know, 21 other guys playing football at the same time as him, and he gets the loss. Sometimes it doesn't make sense, but... um so their stats can just be all over the place. And Mike Vick did things. And you talked about um, Brett Favre breaking that mold. And I think Mike Vick just took it even further. And now we're seeing that. More people want to get back to that. And then we're also looking for the true passer. Um, you know, you got Kyler Murray's, those guys that are doing the same thing these days. Uh, we'll see. We'll see what the, the position holds in the next 10 years. But the more we get to touch football, the more those guys are, you know, going to prosper because 
I can run around real fast right until the end, and you better not hit me harder. It's a flag, or I might throw it over your head. We'll see. But so um, I made a small list on the side here, and it's just on the way. And these are guys that I think are amazing quarterbacks. They just have to – they got to pay their dues, and they've got to be in the league a little bit longer. Um, Josh Allen, you know, there's – there's quarterbacks that you talk about people who lived in and we go to the basketball world, people who lived in the Jordan era that never got a ring because Michael Jordan was playing basketball, right? Like there's that, there's those, all those guys. And now they all seem to be on a talk show for the NBA or whatever. But um, that's, that's what Tom Brady has done to the football world too, right? I mean, he had what two careers essentially that would have been number one on this list and he did them both. So um Sneak peek at my number one there, I guess. Anyway, the guys are on the way. Josh Allen, Joe Burrow. I, I think that guy is going to be ice cold the rest of his career. We'll just see where it goes. You know, getting to the Super Bowl and and with a team that probably shouldn't have been there, making things happen, just couldn't quite pull out the win. Uh, Justin Herbert, I think, is an absolute gunslinger, like you said. And then Brock Purdy is my surprise quarterback of the century, my guy. Like, uh, you know, the very last pick of the NFL draft, and he shows up and went, how many games did he win? Seven in a row? Yeah, uh, something like that. And I know I just said wins and losses are a quarterback so stat, but and I'm gonna let you do your list. I want to interrupt when you get your top ten list, but I do want to say some things about our on the ways. So first of all, I'm not even so sure Josh Allen is not even the best quarterback for the Bills. I think that distinction goes to Jim Kelly until Josh Allen wins a Super Bowl or gets to a Super Bowl. Although Absolutely. I do, I do think he's a great quarterback. I'm still not sure that uh, Tim Tua is not better than Justin Herbert. So I know we would debate that one. That'd be a good debate one day. Uh, I, I I follow you on Joe Burrow. I've seen what you see on Joe Burrow. Let's see if Brock Purdy can win when his defense isn't the best in the NFL. So let's Absolutely. just see what that happens there. But I won't yep. interrupt in your top 10. Nope, that's to- all right. So I'll get to the top 10 and quit burning all this time up. So my number 10 is Joe Montana. So I'll preface this with saying I was not um, a football watcher. I don't know if I was alive. When did this guy play? In the 80s? 80s. Yeah. yeah so, I mean, I wasn't born until 88. So it's not like I could turn the TV on and watch him play ball. But going back and watching what he did and Listen, my dad talk about San Francisco football back then. Um, absolutely amazing. And watching his highlights, the guy had it all. Like I said, the golden boy, that era. Um, my number nine is Peyton Manning, the sheriff, man. I think that, and maybe it's because of the bias of like, I want my quarterback to be able to run around too. And the guy just didn't have it, right? I mean, he might be the slowest O-line 40 time on earth, <laughs> but, you know, trying to play quarterback. Um, but he absolutely could. I think his study habits and the way that he broke down the game and understood everything. I love the Manning cast. They do on Monday night football. Now, man, talk about just going in and learning football from some guys that have been doing it for a long time. His brother will never be on this list. Cause I hate the giants, but uh, you know, he was probably somewhere around that 11 to 15 range as well. I mean, he beat the, the Brady uh, Brady and the uh, Patriots twice when he had no chance whatsoever. So he's got to be pretty good at this game. Drew Brees, um, he he kind of is that pulls the heartstrings, doing less with more. Yes, he's had some weapons around him, but all we ever heard his whole career was about how he couldn't even see over the O line, right? I mean, they're they're recruiting all these or drafting all these big guys to to play O line, and he has to. I guess remember his you know his chin was always up, and he's just trying to get that extra little inch of vision. Um, but the guy could just absolutely bomb it out there. And then watching the Chargers let him go, and Saints had to pick him up, and just rewrote his career. Honestly, I mean. Would well, they win one there or two Super Bowls? Uh, they won I think he won thing. one there. Yeah. yeah. Um, go on 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 the uh, onside kick. You know, after halftime, it really sealed the deal. Uh, Dan Marino is my number seven. Uh, once again, just the stats are amazing. If you're rewriting record books, I don't care how many Super Bowls you have. You've got to be in this list, in my opinion. Um, you you're setting records for all the stats that we keep on quarterbacks. You've got to be a good quarterback, right? Um, Steve Young, and I loved his his um, style of play, just the, kind of the, the running around, and you know, he was the fast kid, but he's going to throw it too. I, don't, I just really enjoyed watching Steve Young play. Once again, in highlights, I wasn't, wasn't exactly turning on the boob tube when I was in my early single-digit ages. <laughs> John Elway was probably the first quarterback that I can remember watching, aside from Troy Aikman. Once again, he's not on this list because you know he had Emmett Smith that really carried his career. I still think he's a great quarterback, but – didn't make the you list. Could, you could make a case John Elway and Troy Aikman might be the same quarterback. Yeah, yeah. Could be. Um, I just like hearing the stories about John Elway and how, you know, he just kind of gutted it out with some – where I think Troy got to lean on other people, I think John Elway had to do it himself. And 
always hearing about his rocket passes, you know, he's throwing so fast, he's breaking dude's fingers and mm -hmm. just absolutely, you know, it's, I just love the stories behind him. And that moves him up my list, I guess. I don't, maybe it's my fan favorite list better than, uh, Brett Favre, you used gunslinger and that's exactly how I've always thought of him. And I'm sure it's probably because I heard NFL say it at some point, but the original gunslinger, um, I love his attitude and, and it's, and it'll speak for some of the guys on this list as well. But uh, just that you're not going to beat me. I'm better than you. I'm not coaching my backup. No, I'm not going to develop him. That's your job, right? Like, cause that's kind of how when Aaron Rodgers came in, he's like, no, I'm not doing it. You, you drafted him. You, you know, you develop him. So I kind of like that. Like, I'm not going to help you develop my replacement. Um, I kind of wish he'd just quit in his prime. It seems like, he went on and tried to do more football, and it just wasn't. I mean, you look Aaron at the Rogers Jets following his footsteps. I know it. Jets and then the the um, Vikings, and he probably should just shut her down. But he played a lot more. I mean, he had a Michael Jordan flu game there with the Vikings, right? He came out mm -hmm. injured and and still came out and tried to get things done. Patty Mahomes is my number three. No one can deny his absolute talent. Um, his arm angles, his the ability to run around. Same thing. The guy's got weapons. If you've got Travis Kelsey, who could be, <laughs> seems like a number one receiver on half the teams in the league, and he's playing tight end for them, uh, that's just not fair. Uh, they did trade away Tyreek Hill and got rid of his absolute deep threat. So we'll see, man. I I, I think I, I'm not so sure the next two Super Bowls aren't, you know, just aren't his. I heard a, a comment last year, and it, it made a lot of sense, and they talked about the MVP trophy, and they said they just should call it the Patrick Mahomes trophy or award and just give it to other quarterbacks that aren't Patrick Mahomes because he should win it every year. And he probably honestly should, but my number two is Aaron Rodgers, who's actually has won it every year for you know two years in a row. Um, he, he's, he's one of the guys that keeps taking it away from, from Mahomes, unfortunately, or fortunately Aaron Rodgers would probably be my number one on this list. I just think that he continues everywhere. He goes to see success in ways that aren't always win and loss. And, Man, some years you just wonder what is going on up in Green Bay, and I'm I'm kind of glad he's out of there. I thought he would retire there, but I don't know. Maybe Patrick is the only quarterback in the league right now that when he walks on the field, the team is going to win the game. I mean, they have the best shot with him on the field. Um, a lot of drama the last couple of years, I think, hurt his reputation with people, but, man, he's just a, a, a solid quarterback, and, and his – one Super Bowl may not ever be enough to put him up this high on anyone else's list, and that's okay. But I think that when he hits the field, your team has a chance to win it all. And, you know, unfortunately, it didn't happen for him some years. And then everybody's number one, and if it's not your number one, it's because you're lying to yourself because you're a hater, and that's Tom Brady. The man had two Hall of Fame careers that were separated by, like, a couple of years in the middle that would have been great years for some quarterbacks. So I don't know what else you could want in, in a in – a, player maybe he shouldn't have played last year but that's the only year I mean if you look back I mean he just terrorized the league he is the football's Michael Jordan um he kept a lot of rings off of a lot of other people's fingers <laughs> and and I think we're seeing right now that maybe he made Belichick you know I'm I'm a fan of Belichick's too but he's got to start over and he doesn't have Tom Brady back there and it's you know things haven't been that great so we'll see uh, maybe he's trusting that new quarterback a little bit too much. But Tom Brady is the ultimate. He is the GOAT. He always will be. I don't know that anyone can ever do what he's done again until we're cyborgs and we have 50-year careers or something because the guy just did it all. So yeah. there you go. My very long-winded top 10 and some and some people that I think will be in this list in the next 10 years. Yeah, I would say of the young quarterbacks that are not on the list, Joe Burrow has the chance to be the next one. All right, man. Well, we've uh, we've done all the things. We talked about situational football, the important ones to understand. Um, <clears throat> why we should practice those situational football uh, situations, situational football situations throughout the week. And then uh, how can we incorporate it into our practice plans? So, Coach, why don't you once again tell us the ways we can simplify football for our staff and our players? Sure. Uh, Coaching 101 Podcast, again, is sponsored by Findaway Productions. Find a way Productions produces OffensiveCoordinatorAcademy.com, all things offense, including the full academy, all the workbooks, templates, all kinds of materials, OffensiveCoordinatorAcademy.com. 
DefensiveCoordinatorAcademy.com, which includes the Defensive Coordinator Academy, also the Workbook, also the Defensive Line Academy and Workbook, and multiple other defensive materials, DefensiveCoordinatorAcademy.com. Finally, FBCoachSimpson.com, which houses the Gun T System, 60 Hours, nine books, plenty of other materials, all dealing with running the Gun T. 30 books total, including fundraising, how to be a coach type books, workbooks, three, four swarm materials, also the three, four swarm defensive system. Headsets, the free digital magazine is also housed at fbcoachsimpson.com. Finally, if you'd like to receive email updates on when we're dropping a new episode, what the new episode is going to be, or other materials, go to fbcoachsimpson.com slash podcast. That's fbcoachsimpson.com slash podcast to get on the email list and receive all the updates you might want. Awesome. Appreciate that. Um, also like to remind you about adaptable physical therapy. We have a brand new clinic. Well, I say brand new. It's been open since April soft open in May the 4th. We did, we did, uh, Star Wars Day for our grand opening, so it'll always be easy to remember. Um, they're in Grove, Oklahoma. You know, you can call today. You can look us up on Twitter at AdaptablePT. Um, write us an email, AdaptablePT at gmail.com. My wife is the the doctor there, it's, uh, Samantha Chamberlain. She specializes in concussions, so if you've got, a, a unfortunately, a player who's suffered a concussion through any way, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be sport-related, but if they have a concussion, please send them over to see her if you're in the area. Um, she's Man, she's so good at what she does, and she's going to be one of the top PTs in the country for years to come just because she does what we do right now for football. That's what she's doing for PT. So she really believes in fitness forward and and uh, is trying to help people through life, at, whether it be early ages dealing with injuries or later in life. And, you know, she believes that you're old, not weak. So big time into uh, people staying active into their old age. And she's a geriatric specialist as well. So, you know, she's there to help you get back under weights or run or walk or whatever you can't do that you should be able to do in normal life. She wants to help you get back to that. Um, also over at um, athleticspeedmovement.com, you can find a new program that I'm a part of where we're helping you help your team run faster. And it's, you know, a lot of people talk about you can't teach speed. And I just think that's not true. At this age, the kids that we're teaching do not know how to run. They've never been taught how to run. And that's what this program is for. Um, it's based off Del, the teachings of Del Basquet. Del's been doing it since 1979. He was the original speed trainer in the NFL. He's worked with just about every NFL team out there, many, many colleges, um, Ohio State, Texas, uh, Oregon. They go on and on and on, his list does. And like I said, he's been doing it since 79, so he's got lots of years of experience. But he will help you teach your kids how to run, and you will see speed increases and our goal is for the opposing team to let their gra grass grow tall. So when you show up, I want to see tall grass covering your cleats even, man. I want to be the tallest grass you've ever seen on a football field because they're afraid of your speed. So that's our goal. All right, Coach, we're going to talk about social media. So where can we find you on social media? Uh, my things are all FB Coach Simpson. So <laughs> FB Coach Simpson is my Twitter handle. You can find me in all the Facebook groups. There's plenty of them. Uh, all the academies, offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator, head coach academy, all of those. Facebook groups, or email me, fbcoachsimpson at gmail.com. Reach out to me or Daniel if you'd like to have us talk about a certain topic or uh, suggest a guest for us to bring on. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Coach Chambo OK. My email is chamberlainfootballconsulting at gmail.com. My coach said reach out if you want to come on the podcast or you have someone that you think would do well here, that's great. We're always trying to have people that know football come on and talk a little football. The podcast on Twitter is at Coaching101Pod. You can go there and, and you can become a follower and figure out when we're, you know, with the little tidbits we drop and our sneak peeks of episodes coming throughout the week. And then, of course, you know, you'll be able to see when they do drop on Sunday morning. So I want to thank you for being a listener to the Coaching 101 podcast. We hope you'll join us next week as we continue to make the complex more simple. Please consider subscribing to the show so you'll always know when the new episodes are out. We'll leave you with this. It's hard to beat someone who never gives up. No matter the situation, find a way.